Welcome to Drop Everything Podcast number six, my conversation with Cirque du Soleil juggler, Pat McGuire. Before we get to Pat's talk, let's talk a little bit about our sponsors. Let's start with the IJA, the International Juggling Association. You can find them at juggle.org. I've been a member for over 30 years, and I've never regretted my decision to join the IJ. In fact, I am life member number 84. For information about juggling and jugglers, to attend their annual convention, and to be part of the world's greatest juggling community, check out juggle.org and the International Juggling Association. Also, my personal coaching website, braindrizzles.com. If you want to add comedy to your juggling, if you're interested in pursuing juggling as a professional career, check out braindrizzles.com for my personal coaching and mentoring services. Now, let's go on to our talk. Now, in the time I've been juggling, many things have changed. Uh, venues have come and venues have gone. One thing that has changed is the growth and the creation of one of the greatest circus franchises in the world, Cirque du Soleil. If you ever wondered what it's like to work with Cirque or to be directed as an 18-year-old by Michael Motion in your first professional performances, check out this conversation with the great Pat McGuire. Now, Pat, uh, my first connection with you, I believe, was at the IGA Festival when you won the juniors. I believe I was a judge. Uh, you were like 16, if, I, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, 16. That would have been in uh, 91 in St. Louis. Now, what was the journey that brought you there? I was always fascinated on how people discover juggling and why they want to become jugglers. Let's get a little background. Who was the first juggler you saw, and how did you discover juggling? Well, for me, I started, uh, I guess I was 12 when I first learned to juggle three balls. And uh, my father and I were uh, over at a friend of, of his house, and uh, he was learning to to juggle three balls with the, with the klutz book, juggling for the complete klutz. And uh, we thought that was pretty cool. So we went out and bought the book and uh, taught ourselves. And we had little competitions back and forth to see who could go the longest. And uh, yeah, that's when I was 12. And then I didn't really touch it. You know, it was like the book was around the house and the balls were laying in the corner somewhere. But I didn't really ever practice or give it much thought. And really out of the blue, uh, I guess two years later, something like that, I was 14. I picked up the balls. I was bored one day, I guess. And I just started playing around. I was reading through the book and I started teaching myself some of the, some of the tricks in the book. And, uh, from there in the back of that book, there was uh, information about, uh, uh, where to get different props, clubs and rings and stuff like that. I forget who, who, who it was that was selling them, but it was through the, through the Klutz company, I guess. So, and uh, so I sent away and I got some juggling rings and I got some clubs. Uh, before that, actually, I, I made my own clubs out of, I think they were like rubbing alcohol bottles. And I disassembled the, the family rake and cut it up into pieces, you know, <laughs> uh, probably a, a familiar story. And did your dad continue in juggling or you kind of no, did this on your own or? No, I did that on my own. Yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I guess I was looking for something new. So anyway, I uh, I got these props. And then also in the back of the book, it uh, mentioned the IJA, International Juggler Association. And uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that year, uh, this was 89, 1989, the, uh, the IJA festival was happening in Baltimore. And uh, so my mother uh, saw that I was interested in this and asked me if I would maybe like to go to this uh, convention. And I said, sure, why not? Let's do it. So we, uh, the two of us, just my mom and I, uh, motored out to Baltimore, I guess, you know, three and a half hours drive or something from Pittsburgh, maybe four, I can't remember. Anyway, we got there like a couple days into the festival or maybe like halfway through. But I remember we got there in the evening and we arrived right during the junior national juggling championships that's when we arrived at the festival and uh anyway to you know to say the least i was completely blown away because i had no idea what level juggling could be taken to up, up until that point like i thought that well maybe i'll enter this competition you know i can juggle four balls by that time you know i could do three clubs you know i didn't do a lot with it but i thought i was pretty good because i'd never seen any other jugglers so Needless to say, I was completely uh, blown away. That year was the year that Anthony Gatto... Uh, oh, did he win that year? No, he didn't win that oh. year. He was a special guest. This is the I year... See. I'm sure you were at that festival. Oh, yeah, I was. Um, 
But he broke every record under the sun that year. He did the seven clubs for two and a half minutes and the, you know, five clubs for 45 minutes. Basically, every juggling record that had ever existed, he blew it out of the sky. Was that the year Cindy Marvel won the yes. competition? Yes, Cindy Marvel won. Uh, I competed that year. I did, I did poorly. Did you? Did you? Okay. I, I remember I was doing fine. And then uh-huh. um, Todd Smith had given me some new silicon balls. Like I was practicing in the gym. Right. And I was going to do balls, and I think I was doing uh, discs at that point, mm-hmm. one of the few few disc jugglers. And he said, oh, your, your silicon balls look kind of ratty, or maybe I was using lacrosse balls. Let me give you this brand new set of silicon balls, which I thought was great. And I'm practicing with the balls. And, but I didn't realize that when, the, when my hands got sweaty you know, during the competitions, right. they would become like ice cubes. Ah, because they so, were brand new. They hadn't been broken in yet. Yeah. Hadn't been broken in. And it, when I was rehearsing with them, I didn't have a problem because, uh, you know, I wasn't really pushing myself or getting sweaty or anything. Wasn't mm-hmm. nervous at all, just practicing. But by the time I got to five, I just remember thinking, I can barely do a cascade with these yeah. things. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. kind of fell apart. And yeah. and for that one reason, Cindy Marble won. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, she did a great routine. Do you remember who won, who won juniors that year? Who did one? Oh, I think his name was, was it Jonathan Ro- Rosenberg, I want to say? Gosh, I, I don't know. That's, that, I, don't, that was, I don't think 89 we're talking about? 89, yeah. I don't believe he's active anymore in, in the juggling world, but uh, Jay Gilligan competed that year. I remember, I remember him. There were like 20 competitors. This was before they used to, I think, I don't think they had any sort of preliminaries. I think you just signed up in a way it you used to go on, on and on and on, on and on. on. Yeah, I remember there were like 20 acts that night. Anybody and, stand out as like a juggler who thought like, that's the style I want to go into. I mean, you sure certainly got to, but did you look at someone in particular well, at, and say, festival, that's my style? At the festival, uh, at, they called it a convention back then, I think, right? Mm, I think so. <laughs> I think it was a convention still. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, we arrived during the juniors and, you know, that, that was, I, I remember just being blown away by what I saw there. But then, you know, throughout the next few days of, of the convention, I just, you know, I went to all the shows and, and uh, I remember, I want to say watching the uh, watching the competition. I guess the one that that you were involved with the the seniors there that year. I remember Michael Menez act really, mm-hmm. really inspired me. Just that he was able to communicate so much with uh, so little, and you know, as far as you know, number of objects that he was. Uh, I think it's when he came out with that pretty that, well known uh, three ball routine. I think to yeah. root beer rag. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Billy Joel song. That yeah. was quite a that was quite a step up. And we had Peter Davidson, who who had that sort of juggling to music choreography style right. and air yeah. jazz. Oh yeah, he. I I discovered him. You know, later later on, and he was he was very inspirational to me. Just the way that he moved and I mean, the whole kind of classy gentleman juggler style thing. And I guess I I kind of tried to emulate that when I when I started getting into uh, juggling a little bit more seriously. But, well, you always struck me as a Peter Davidson type. You had that sort of long, lanky build and mm-hmm. kind of that Dick Van Dyke boy next door charm, as I remember. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> so then you, so you were inspired by the convention. And at that point, did you say, okay, I'm going to come back? I said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to win the junior competition. That's what I told myself. And uh, did you come back next year, or did so? You did you take a couple years off? Was it? No, 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 no. I got to work right away. So right. Uh, <laughs> I went back to Pittsburgh, very much inspired, uh, with a new purpose in life. Any and, scene going on in Pittsburgh? Or was there a local juggling group? Yes, or? there was a juggling club. So I got back to Pittsburgh, and uh, I found out about the uh, juggling club that met actually twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays at Carnegie Mellon University, and. Uh, so that that that's where I met uh, Rick Rubenstein, okay, and uh, Ben Schoenberg, and uh, Jack Calvin had just graduated the year before, so uh, he was kind of out of the picture. But but uh, Rick was, I guess, a senior that year, so they were planning on after he finished up getting his degree, uh, moving on and uh, continuing his clockwork, which right. they did. Yeah, they did for many years, maybe a good ten or fifteen year career. I think yeah, they had, yeah. Yeah, yeah, quite a while. So yeah, so I went started going to this uh, uh, juggling every Wednesday and Saturday. I think it m- met like from four o'clock to eight o'clock, and uh, it was quite a quite a trek away from where I was living at the time. But my parents drove me out there twice a week, and uh, I didn't miss a meeting for two years straight. 
and uh, I just had in my mind that I want to come back and win that. And what was your daily day. practice like? So you practice every day, then you have these two meetings yeah. per week. Were you doing it for several hours a day? or least, I juggled at least eight hours a day. Eight hours a day? Yeah. For two from years? Moment, yeah. Yeah. From the, moment, from the moment I woke up in the morning to the moment I went to bed, every bit of free time that I had was spent working on juggling. So and, kids, uh, if you're listening at home... <laughs> want to have a, a career as a juggler, there always should be one point in time where you crank out hours like Pat McGuire, like eight hours a day. Did you find any, any adverse effects? I know when I did that kind of time, uh, I tried to do six hours a day. I broke it into two, three hour chunks. Mm-hmm. Like my hands would start to bleed in between my fingers. Yeah, depending on what you're <laughs> juggling, I guess. If you're doing rings and stuff like that, it right. can really tear up your hands. But I think... Uh, did you yeah, have any coaching? Was this pretty? Was was like, Rika involved in coaching, or were you just kind of? I'm sorry, I wouldn't necessarily say that. That's probably the best route to go. Right, right. <laughs> you know, but it's 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 what it's what I decided that I was going to do. You know, probably looking back on it, there would have been a you know a a better way. You know, a better timeline in order to get to where I wanted to get. Especially if I had you know a coach, or if I had you know, the sorts of resources that exist today with the internet and things like that. Uh, but, you know, I was very much self-taught. Uh, so when you're self-taught, you make a lot of mistakes. And uh, uh, What were some of these mistakes you think you made? Uh, practicing something too much? or just, No, I think probably with uh, body position in regards to uh, the correct mechanics of, of a pattern and where to hold, where to, you know, where to hold your shoulders, where to hold your arms, uh, you know, not to keep, not to, where to keep the pattern, you know, try to, try to stay under the pattern, try to keep your arms down, uh, keep your elbows by your sides, things like that, mm-hmm. that if you don't have somebody watching you, you know, helping you with those things, uh, you know, you're probably, you know, you're just going to do it right. the way that, that, that you do it. You know, I did videotape myself a lot and I was always very much, uh, concerned with the aesthetic of what I was doing. So it, it had to look good. That's, that's overall what I was concerned with. Uh, so, you know, if I was doing something that didn't look good, then I would change it so that it looked good. But even if it looked good, I may not have been doing it the optimal way. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a coach. So there was like in the, in the juniors during that time frame, uh, a lot of the competitors were being coached by Benji Hill, which I'm, who I'm sure, you know, sure. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of all, they had a very strong technique. Uh, you know, they, he was giving them uh, very strict guidelines of how juggling was supposed to be. And uh, as a result, they had a lot of uh, positive reinforcement into the mechanics of their throws and catches and stuff like that, which I didn't have. So I wasn't progressing as a numbers juggler, per se, I guess as maybe I could have if, if I had that sort of strict, uh, 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 would you say, strict you sort know, of regime. And that's yeah. the knock on them is that they used to call them Benji bots. Yeah, they did. Yeah, because they didn't have a lot of creativity. No, they had a certain mold that they all exactly. seemed to fit into. And, and, and that's something that, that Rick Rubenstein was very helpful to me because he was like, listen, you don't want to, if you want to really win this competition, you have to be different. Mm-hmm. You don't want to do what everyone else is doing because you won't stand out. And so that's when I went about and I said, okay, well, I'm going to, what can I do that's different? Well, there wasn't a lot of other kids my age that were doing juggling with hats and, and, uh, uh, the head roll was something that, that I didn't see anyone doing. So I taught myself that I literally walked around with a ball everywhere I went during school hours, I would ask to be excused to the bathroom so that I could practice for five minutes, you know, and that's the way to learn that sort of technique. It's all about kind of muscle memory. So you just have to hit those positions over and over and over and create these positive synapses in your brain so that, you know, kind of like learning music, I'm learning to play the accordion. Now it's been about three years and it's kind of like learning to juggle all over again. (laughs) Well, there are definitely similarities. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of jugglers who who play music. I play a little bit myself and that the coordination, the mind sort of body connection. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of similarities and I find it uh, a good, a good conjunctive activity. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I play a little accordion, probably not. I've seen your work. You're a little bit more advanced than me, but uh, I like the accordion. It's very complete. It is just on its own. You can just go out by yourself and, and, uh, yeah, you got the chords, you got the melody, you got the dynamics. 
Yeah. So did you skip? So you skipped a year at the convention, though. Did you attend the next year's convention? No, no, no. I didn't skip. I went. I okay. Just went. I, so the next year was in. Uh, it was in L.A. Okay. And so, yeah, my mom and dad and I, we all went out because uh, they uh, were interested in moving out west. So uh, Arizona, which is where I am right now, talking mm-hmm. to you. I'm on a, I'm on a break from Kidam right now. So, uh, so you're at your parents' home in Arizona. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sponging off my parents. Nice. My girlfriend's here, too. She's also in the show with me. Uh, yeah, technically, well, officially, we were supposed to be performing in Tel Aviv. <laughs> As oh, of okay. uh, two nights ago, I think was the right. premiere. So they had to reschedule because of the. Uh... Yeah, yeah, they had to cancel. So. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll get so, into we'll get into the Quidam stuff because I think a lot of yeah. people are very interested in what it's like to work with Cirque du Soleil. But let's let's bring it up to speed. So you went to L.A., which was uh, another yeah. year I was involved with. Yep. Did yep, you yeah, did you sure. compete that year? No, 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 it didn't compete. I didn't feel I was ready yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chuck Gunter won the juniors that year. Uh, Let's see, Mark Neiser won the seniors. Yeah, uh, I came in uh, third that year. Yeah, you were wonderful. You were great. I remember you. It was great. Thank you. It was really nice. Uh, you did the the plates again, I remember, or the discs. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I remember I did the hat, ball, and cane routine for several right. years. Uh, the best year I think I did was Montreal when I did my golf routine. Oh, that was that was brilliant, yeah. Because uh, I remember doing it without any drops, which I was very – it wasn't that most technical routine, but to have pulled it off – Danny Mulligan. Danny Mulligan, the, the clown prince of golf. Yeah, it was awesome. I love that act. That was great. And then Chris Creamer was our headliner because I also directed the show that year. Yes, 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 yes. And Fritz I'm Coleman sure. was the MC, and because uh, I grew up in LA, so that was my home turf, and it was right. took place at UCLA. Yep. So you took yes. a year off, but then you came to the convention. You thought, okay, I'm not ready said, yet. Yeah, well, I didn't feel I was ready yet, and then uh, so yeah, came to the came to the convention and uh, had a great time. Uh, inspired again, of course, and then went back home. And in between the two big IJ conventions, I was going to a bunch of regional ones, you know, in Ohio and Michigan, uh, all around uh, kind of the Midwest where I where I grew up. So, uh, but the IJ festival really was kind of like the that was the, well, the those big, were the uh, golden days. I think I think starting from the early '80s throughout maybe the late 90s, it was, mm-hmm. there was a growth and excitement, and uh, those were those were some good years with the IJ. Yeah. Now, those are those are the years that I know. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I My involvement has waned a little bit in these last few years. Maybe next year I'll try to get involved again. But yeah. uh, those were my years as well. So, okay, so then you come back, and where was the next year's convention taking place? Oh, so you're saying... Uh, St. Louis. St. Louis. Yeah, and, and leading up to that... Uh, I decided to go to the uh, was it uh, the uh, Atlanta Groundhog Day Juggling Convention? Okay, there's a, a couple other competitors uh, had had gone to that and competed because they have this uh, competition for sure the Philly the Phil, Phil or something. Phil, or? Yeah, the Phil. Yeah, they yeah. they give away a most magnificent, most spectacular, and most stupendous. I think, and at least that's what I. <laughs> I think it changes year to year, but those are basically the. We actually competed against each other. I remember. Uh, I was there. Was that the one year I went? One year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would have been, you were there? I remember you were juggling these big uh, red wiffle ball bats. Remember those really big ones, the red ones? Yeah, I don't think I did that. Did I do that in the competition though? No, no. I just remember seeing that in the gym. I remember making a mistake and doing something. I had this piece of music. I think it was by Sting. Okay. It was like Moon Over Bourbon Street. It was kind <laughs> of this moody. There's mm-hmm. the Moon Over Bourbon Street. Very kind of like it would have been a better theatrical piece. And they had it on the gym floor. And and people were like, why didn't you do something different? And I'm like, well, I, I should have, I guess. Because I did not win. Did you win a... Uh... I, w- I won the most magnificent award. Uh, you know, that that competition's judged by, like, just everyday Joes. Yeah. It's like the friends of the, of the organizers that, that aren't involved in juggling in any way, other than that they know a couple of jugglers. So, uh, which, is, which is cool, you know. So you get a kind of a layman's... Uh, Appreciation. I can't blame Todd Smith for losing that one. I think that was my per, poor choice in uh, in routining. <laughs> so uh, you won fair and square, Pat McGuire. Well, I was I used to be young and cute then, so you know the kids always have an advantage with the, the getting the cuteness getting the cuteness factor in there. So well, you grew up to be a very handsome man, so I, oh. I think you're doing fine in that regard. So so <laughs> but so let's take it. So you won an award there, and how many was that? A few months before the before the IGA or. Well, that whenever Groundhog Day is, I guess when is that? February, like April, or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, not good know. with the, <laughs> not good with the, uh, the holidays. Spring. It was spring. It was I a think. few months before. Sure. 
a few months before the the big. And was that deck. basically the routine or part of the routine that you were going to do at the IJA? You think? Yeah, 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 definitely part of it. It might even have been the exact routine. I can't recall if it was. I'm sure I changed. I think they it. were shorter. I mean, I believe they were like three minutes or something. I don't think you got a chance to do a whole. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. Quite a while ago. I don't remember. So then, so you came on, so then you said, okay, this is going to be my year. You were about 16 yeah. or so, or? 16, yep, I was 16, and uh, was in St. Louis, and. And that I was like think... the 60th, right? Like, a, there was a big. No, no, I think the 60th was, was Pittsburgh, wasn't it? Was that Pittsburgh? Yeah, maybe you're right, I don't know. I wasn't there in Pittsburgh. Okay. Even though I grew up in Pittsburgh, I uh, wasn't there. But, okay. uh, yeah, this was, I forget, the 40, I want to say it was the. 42nd. Okay, so quite a way from, ways from the 60th, so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anyway. So we'll let that drop. We'll let that drop. <laughs> okay, so you, so you get to, uh, to St. Louis. Yes. And yeah. do you remember who you competed against that year? Yeah, oh yeah. I was competing against, uh, well, Jay Gilligan again. And we were good friends by that time. Uh, uh, Jay Gilligan, uh, Sean McKinney, mm -hmm. uh, Brian Patz. Uh, Robin Chestnut, who was uh, one of ben, uh, Benji, Benji, uh, right, Benji Hills guys, Benji Hills guys. Uh, who else? He apologized to me years later. Robin Chestnut apologized to you. Why? Well, because Benji was a guy who, um, I think he, he he understood that if you took material from many different places, you could fashion a routine together that would be successful. Okay. And we all have, you know, find influence and inspiration from others. And maybe he took it a little too far. And I think at a certain point, he would have these guys go out on the ships with him, you know, these younger jugglers. Yeah. And they would do a portion of the Raspini Brothers show. Uh, I see. I see. And he okay. was one of the jugglers who came up to me and said, you know, for a while I was doing some of your material yeah. and, and felt badly about it in retrospect. Right, yeah, yeah. But I came to also to an understanding with Benji many years later. He uh, he did compensate me after oh. the fact. And um, so, yeah. you know, we're on good terms. I haven't sp spoken to Benji for 15 years or so, but I'm sure he's still out there. Uh, and he'd be a good person to talk to on the podcast. I got yeah, no... Yeah, would be. Definitely would be. No hard feelings. So maybe someday him and I can sit down for a powwow. Yeah, well, so... <laughs> I'm being very diplomatic there, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get back to the so you're so that you're competing against uh, Robin and and Brian Pats. Yeah, Robin, Brian Pats, uh, Sean McKinney, uh, Ben Tolpin, mm -hmm. another friend of mine. Uh, Went on to a lot of success in commercials and, and oh yeah, yeah, hugely. Yeah, yeah, it's done quite well. You see him a lot. You see when you when if you know Ben Tolpin, you go, oh, he's on that commercial, and he's on yeah, that yeah. commercial. Yeah, he's done some pretty funny ones too. Yeah. yeah, he really got into that. He was even in a, he was in a. Uh, sitcom that did not go very far. It was called The Mullets. Yeah. If, I don't know if, if... I remember I went on set with him one time uh, when I was passing through L.A. It was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, well, he's also made some independent movie recently. Yeah, okay. That got some good good reviews and good notices. So uh, check out Ben Tolpin if you're listening. You know, look him up on uh, maybe YouTube. Check out his reel. Uh, talented yeah, young awesome. I remember he did really well. I remember he uh, competed... The following year in, in Montreal, he did great. He had yeah, a nice, did. solid six balls. Yeah, he had a great act. It was uh, kind of, he the, uh, Rick and Rick Rubenstein and Jack Calvin uh, kind of coached him for that the following year. I remember he had a gag with the yo-yo. Came out, did the yo-yo, cut the string. Yeah. Yo-yo ran off the stage. It was a very complete, uh, well-thought-out piece. You know, it, 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 had a, it, it had a thematic going on and... It had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it was very entertaining. I thought it was great. Um, I remember your routine when you competed. It also had sort of a, a thematic. It was definitely different than the other junior competitors. It was sort of more well thought out, I thought. Well, that's what I was I was shooting for. I wanted to do I, – I really wanted to do – you know, back in those days, back when I first started, I was very much – about tricks you know i wanted to do tricks lots of tricks because that's what you know that's what jugglers do <laughs> right and uh, so i was trying to do lots of cool tricks tricks that other people hadn't done so i was trying to come up with my own tricks and and also tricks that people that you know in my kind of demographic you know uh, uh hadn't done before 
mainly the head roll, working with the hats and those types of things. So I, I, I guess uh, I guess I stuck out because I was doing something different, and I had a, f- a fair amount of uh, you know technical skill with it. It wasn't just something different, but I I took it to a, a pretty high level pretty quickly. So and did you end with a seven ball bounce, as I remember? Or I actually ended it with uh, when I did that in the middle. I did mm. like a seven ball routine thing where I started off with the ball on my head and juggled six briefly, and then dropped it into a seven ball bounce and threw him into this uh, garbage can. Right. <laughs> yeah, traveling around with a, a big Rubbermaid garbage can proved to be quite funny at times, especially going to the Groundhog Day juggling convention on a Greyhound bus with your garbage can. With my garbage can, yeah. The guy wouldn't put a <laughs> uh, a tag on it, and so he wouldn't. They they said it couldn't be considered official luggage, but they would put it under the bus for me. And of course, a Greyhound bus, you know, stops at every little podunk town between A and B. So I was always having to get off and explain that, in fact, this was my garbage can and I really wanted to keep it. So <laughs> you didn't think they had garbage cans in uh, St. Louis that you could, you know, well, I did, I did have <laughs> what limited, is your garbage can? I had limited resources. I would have had to go out to a right you know, a place and get one. And plus this one had wheels. It was pretty special to me. So still have that garbage can or. Oh no. Right. Long gone. So not that special. Long gone. No, I've moved up. I have a really nice, uh, what is it called? Uh, human, is it the human design or something? It's, it's stainless, stainless steel. It's beautiful. So with all that Quidam money and the Cirque du Soleil money, you've splurged and bought yourself a very nice a garbage really can. Nice garbage Congratulations, can. Pat McGuire. Thank you. So how do you feel you did? So you, were you, did you feel nervous going in? Did you feel prepared? Oh, yeah. Very nervous. Yeah. Absolutely. Very nervous. I still get nervous all the time when I'm on stage. You know, I've been doing it professionally since I was 18. I'll be 40 this year. And yeah, I still I still get jitters. Absolutely. Especially if it's live TV. That's what that's the thing that always uh, gets me the most nervous. Like we did the we did the Tonight Show, which I know you've done many times. Uh, and any of those live TV shows, they just... Uh, even though the, the the Tonight Show is live to tape, but still, it's basically live. I remember doing those shows. I just kept thinking, I don't want to do something that will haunt me, that will mm-hmm. follow me around. This was even before the days of YouTube. But I remember like uh, there were a couple of appearances. One famous one that comes to mind was Edward Jackman, I think, on the uh, Merv Griffin show. Okay. Where he went to do like a double uh, pirouette with the devil stick and ended up sort of falling on his butt. And you know, you would then you would watch it over and over again, and here's the comes the moment where he's going to fall, and and so I just didn't want to do something that would that would haunt me. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, that's 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 one thing I always talked about with the young jugglers is you know you see these YouTube guys and they make these videos where they're able to do something a thousand times and you know get the one per- perfect run on tape and, and edit it together, and people are like, oh, this guy is so great, and I go, well, put him in a situation where the your arms are like lead and, and you know, your heart is pumping. And then even doing the, I think one of the most nervous I ever got was we did a, a gag with Jay Leno where my partner and I were going to pass torches around him to demonstrate how much better high definition TV was than regular TV. Okay. So all we had to do basically was, you know, I think like 10 throws, like, you know, get the torches going, pass mm-hmm. around him, stop cleanly. Right. And when I was backstage, my heart was thumping. I bet. Because I just felt like any jugglers could do this. It, like, there's really no reason we should be doing this other than he knew us or knew of us. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like if you're doing something difficult and you, you make a mistake, at least you can go like, well, we were trying seven back to back or whatever the thing was. I thought there's no reason for me to miss this or to mess up. Mm-hmm. And that made me very nervous. More so than, than having a reason to mess up. Yeah, but yeah, that, I mean, that's, I think you're just starting to mind, you know, mind screw yourself, yeah. which which is easy to do when you're in those situations. But then usually when you get out there, um, you know, I was just worried that the first throw of the torches was somehow going to tie up, you know, sometimes yeah. like you can kind of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of like a big explosion of torches. Yeah. Uh, well, you're doing a comedy act and you have a thousand and one drop lines to cover all that stuff anyway. So, well, there's I mean, really no comedy. Maybe I can say basically it was just do the yeah. gag. Yeah. Okay. Do it cleanly and get off. So it wasn't like us having a chance to really yeah. do much. But, uh, yeah. So, I, so I, you're I, nervous, I, but you say you're still a little bit nervous even now after all these years. You know, I get less nervous when I have more time. Like, 
like in, in Cirque du Soleil, you know, I do, you know, it's like a five and a half minute act mm -hmm. and it's, you don't have a lot of time to make a connection with the audience. Uh, now I also back up and play the John Gilkey character in Kidam. And when I do that, sometimes I also have to do my juggling act because my juggling act's a backup act in Kidam. So I'm not on stage every show doing my act. Uh, if there's an act out of the show, then, you know, I'll, I'll fill in for that act. Sometimes there's an act out for weeks on end and I'm in every show, you know, uh, at the very least I do it once a week, but anyway, but you never do that. the hat rack act. You do your, your act in that no, place. No, 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 no. I do the hat rack. Oh. Act. I, that's all part of the John Gilkey character. Interesting. Within Kidam and, and once a leg, cause our, our tour schedule is, is broken up into 10 week legs now mm -hmm. cause we're on this uh, arena tour. Uh, I do, I play, I play John Gilkey's character. So, and I do basically, you know, all the bits with the dartboard and just right. all this material, but sometimes there's an act out in addition to that. And I have to do, you know, my juggling act and I have to play it as the John character, but I feel less nervous doing that entire John character than I do just going out and doing my act because I have the time to breathe and create a relationship with the audience that I don't necessarily get to do when I'm just going out there and, and doing sure. my act to music. Uh, yeah, I totally I, get that. Yeah, before I went back to Cirque du Soleil, uh, which was about five years ago, I was doing a solo show in Mexico at these different resorts. And it's the first time that I ever did like a full one hour on my own. And, uh, you know, it was difficult. I kind of had to pad my show a bit because I had never done that much material strictly my, by myself. But uh, I found that I really enjoyed it in the, in, in the sense that it, it gave me a calm. Like I built up a, uh, a relationship with the audience and they trusted me and I trusted them and I was able to just do my best work. Uh, more so than when I just have to go out and do five minutes, like doing these corporate galas. They're kind of my least favorite thing to do because everything is is unknown. You don't know what the stage is going to be like. You don't know what anything is going to be like. You don't even know where you're going to be most of the time. So yeah, it's very much. And it's hard know, to rehearse under the conditions with the lights because usually yeah, it's going to be darker that at, at night. You go in there during the day and they don't have the lights set up. And yeah, well, let's backtrack a little bit. So you now you've won the competitions. Won a competition, yeah, that was thrilling. And Probably. at what point did you say, this was going to be my profession? Or was that always from the beginning in your mind? Uh, I guess early on. I, I want to say, uh, I guess maybe, let's see, maybe the following summer, I went and I took some uh, classes at the uh, Celebration Barn with uh, Fred Garbo. Mm -hmm. He was teaching a workshop he called Antic Arts Workshop. And uh, well, I guess it was a week or two weeks. And I think there I really decided that that's, what I, that's the direction that I wanted to go. I and remember. Anybody we, in your class? I mean, is it a small class? I've never been there myself. I've always wanted to go. Is it a pretty uh, intense small group or, or it was, a larger? It was a pretty small group. I guess maybe there were seven or eight of us, maybe 10. I can't recall exactly. Uh, from all walks of life, you know, a lot of people that were just interested in, you know, maybe they were birthday party clown and they just wanted to get mm -hmm. some more performance skills or, uh, I, I had heard of Fred, obviously seen him at the conventions before and knew of his work with Michael Motion and Bob Berkey, you know, it's fool's fire. And, and, uh, so when I saw that he was teaching a class, I thought that that would be a good thing for me to do. So, uh, yeah, we had at the end of it, there was a presentation and it was just a really positive experience. I was uh, I, I really grow grew a great deal as a performer uh, during that workshop. I learned not just to present something on stage, but really try to have it communicate something. And uh, yeah, I remember after the presentation we did at the end of that, it went really well for me. I did some nice bits and uh, had a lot of character, which I hadn't, you know, worked on before. And yeah, I remember that night that I was just really proud of what I'd done. And I felt that this was the path that I should take. So, and what, so how'd that lead to into your first professional type jobs? What, well, it, I got lucky. I really got lucky because, uh, let's see, after, uh, after I won the juniors, my parents and I moved to Arizona. I did my junior year of high school in Arizona, and then we moved back 
East to Philadelphia for my senior year. And uh, oddly enough, I went to the same high school as Gray Kennedy, mm -hmm. who's also working with Cirque, actually he just finished, but he was for the last four or five years was working with Cirque du Soleil's uh, totem show, Yeah, but graduated from the same high school. He's a few years older than me, so I, we weren't like going to school together, but it's just kind of funny that we both kind of ended up in the same company. But uh, the inventor of the cone. Yes, it's a great, a uh, great, great piece. Yeah, it is. It is a great piece. Yeah, I know Greg. I haven't talked to him for for a long time, but and now there's a couple of jugglers doing his role, which is nice. That it, yeah. it lives on. Yeah, gets Chris money. Uh, Yapini is doing it. So yep. He gets his licensing fee and everything. So he's. And I guess Tom Wall filled in for a bit. Yes. Yeah. As soon as Chris uh, got on tour, I actually saw him that week too, because I was in back home in Portland. That's where I make my home now, mm -hmm. Portland, Oregon. And uh, Totem was in Portland, and he was he had just come in to uh, rehearse to uh, start to take over for uh, uh, for Greg. And he hurt his back as soon as he got on tour. It was really unfortunate, and he had to leave for a while. And uh, he's he's now back, but in the interim period after he left, then Tom Wall stepped in and uh, filled in as well. So yeah, I talked to him during that period. It was a scary period. It was. You know, yeah, we he, we were we're so physical with even though that role itself is not that demanding. Yeah. But when you're worried about even being able to juggle again or you know resume normal activity, there, there's certainly a great deal of panic in that time. I'm glad he recovered and is now you know taking the place. Yeah, he should have he's been. good. I think he, I think he's in New Zealand. Yeah, great. <laughs> That's good. So you're saying you got pretty lucky because you, you just I got lucky. Yeah, I got lucky because uh, just kind of in the right place at the right time. I had. Uh, I, like I said, I, I was uh, living in Philadelphia, in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and they had this uh, uh, juggling convention there, Philadelphia Juggling Convention, uh, every year. I don't know if they still have it or not, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, you you must you you remember Neil Stammer, right? Yeah, of course, and he just was apprehended. He just was wrapped behind me. Yeah, it's a good story all. about how they they realized they did it through facial recognition. Is that how? I, yeah, because he was, he was using a false passport. Okay. And the FBI had created this facial recognition data bank. Okay. And I guess that triggered a red flag that the, oh. the, the passport he had used somehow came up on this database. And they realized, oh, this is not, I think he was using the name Kevin Burke or something like that. Okay. And they realized, oh, this is Neil Stammer. And he's here in Nepal. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. That was one of the big un unsolved mysteries of juggling. What happened to Neil Stammer? What happened to Neil Stammer? Yeah, I know. And maybe we'll get to that in a future podcast, but that's certainly uh, one of the of the stories that, that had been around for 14 years. Yeah. Well, anyway, I met him at the... Uh, at the convention in Philadelphia and very much looked up to him because, you know, he, he was friends with Francis Braun and he had worked professionally at all these cabarets in, in Europe and stuff. And, uh, anyway, I, I met him there and, uh, uh, that, that was basically the end of the story until I got a call out of the blue, uh, from him saying that Michael motion was interested in potentially, uh, casting me for a role. And uh, he told me that, uh, I guess, well, the way it went down was uh, Michael Motion knew Neil Stammer and asked Neil because he knew he was uh, involved in the juggling world because he had opened the juggling capital store in Washington, D.C. at that time, uh, retail juggling shop there. I visited him there once, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he asked him if he knew any any young jugglers who were at least six feet tall who had experience with uh, rolling balls on their head. Mm, okay. <laughs> he had met me just months before. Right. And, so, uh, and you're what, about 6'2 or so? It ring about, no, no, well, just under 6'1". Okay. Yeah. You play taller, so. I play tall. Yeah. Uh, so he recommended me to Michael Motion. Uh, and uh, this was shortly after Michael's uh, PBS special came out and everything. And uh, anyway, he was, mm -hmm. you know, an icon, still is. So, uh, yeah, I got a call out of the blue from Michael Motion, and he asked me if I could send him a videotape because he had been contacted by Cirque du Soleil to create an original uh, manipulation juggling piece for their new show, which was going to start in Las Vegas the following year. 
Uh, that's the show that became The Stare, which is... And you're what, so, about 18 years old at this point? I was 18 in my senior year of high school, yeah, exactly. Nice just about, just about to graduate. Yeah, uh, okay. So yeah, I sent a videotape of, you know, my junior's routine and little little stuff that I had done up until that point and uh, sent it up to him. And uh, he reviewed it, called me back and said that he was interested in meeting me in person. So I was floored. I mean, this was, yeah. you know, at that time... Uh, Cirque du Soleil was really kind of unknown uh, in the mainstream world, ex except that they had just presented their Nouvelle Experience show on HBO. And that's where I had first come to heard of Cirque du Soleil. And I remember seeing that and just being blown away by it. And uh, I had actually gotten to see the show live at the very first IJ Winter Juggling Festival in Las Vegas at the showboat. I don't know. Were you, were you I there? I was, yeah. You were there for that. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, Nouvelle Experience was being presented behind the Mirage Hotel and a tent at that time. And I later found out that it was there as kind of a testing ground uh, to see if that style of entertainment would, would play to a Vegas audience. And if it did well, which it did, they were going to go ahead and uh, build a you know specific uh, theater in their in Steve Wynn's new hotel which was the Treasure Island so and eventually take over the whole strip <laughs> eventually and take over Steve Wynn too yeah. now it's all GM property so but uh, yeah so anyway Michael Motion called me out of the blue said he wanted uh, the videotape he liked the tape he wanted to meet me so my mom and I took the train up to New York and uh, I had an audition with Michael in his loft in the Bowery where he created a lot of his pieces, the triangle, with all the crystal ball stuff, all that stuff. He really worked in solitude in that little uh, loft for years on end. It was just like just up the street from C where CBGB's was, you know. <laughs> so okay. I actually just got to hang out with Mike at the EJC uh, a couple weeks ago, which is the main reason I went because I knew he was going to be a special guest there, and I hadn't seen him for quite a few years, and so it was really nice to see him and. Uh, he was there with his girlfriend and my girlfriend and I, and we all took a ride out into the, the Irish countryside because my grandparents used to live out there. And uh, so I got to play tour guide to Michael Motion. So that was pretty nice. And, but uh, yeah, so I, I, he was interested in hiring me uh, after meeting me. Uh, he showed me the shape, the, you know, the technique that we did in the show eventually. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it was going to be a three P a three person piece that he was putting together. And uh he basically told me right then and there at the end of the audition that he wanted to use me. And he was going to tell the Cirque du Soleil that, you know, I, he, I was going to be one of his guys. So that's how it started for me. Uh, Steven, and who, who are they? So Steve Regatz? Steve Regatz, yeah. Steven Regatz uh, ended up coming into it because he read a post on Rec Dot Juggling that Cirque du Soleil put out uh, looking for jugglers. And he responded to that and then eventually... Uh, he met with Michael Motion in New York, just like I had. He was 10 years older than me. Right. He was in his later 20s. And then Jean Bernard was the third, uh, third manipulator, as they referred to us. <laughs> but that was the act with the, the silver Dorito chip. The silver Dorito, yeah. 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 And the red, well, red balls? Was or? This was a four-sided Dorito. Right. It's a sheet of aluminum uh, that's cut into a square, and you hold it like a diamond, and then it has this S-shaped curve in it. It's, it's very abstract it's kind of hard to describe uh it's one of these things and how kinda... long was the rehearsal period before the only six months. six months uh yeah three months in montreal so i graduated high school i actually had to leave high school two weeks early uh just to be in montreal to start the rehearsal process which was fine with me right <laughs> i didn't find that at all and uh yeah so i did uh three months in las vegas uh, excuse me three months in in montreal and then uh, three months in Las Vegas at the uh, at the theater, and uh, then two years in Las Vegas. So you're living by yourself at this period. So you leave at eighteen and kind of you're on your own, basically. I'm on my own. I'm on my own, living in Las Vegas at the at at eighteen. Yeah, exactly. So I remember seeing that show and seeing you at that time, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking you seemed a little bit not lost per se, but you hadn't really quite found yourself you know yeah oh, no, i was lost yeah i was lost yeah it was it was has a tough it was a tough group it was uh it was well being 18 and being thrown into vegas is it's uh you know it was it was a bit of a whirlwind plus 
this group that we were working with, I mean, they were comp the, the people in the show that I was working with were like all very high level ex Olympic gymnasts, right. and you know, they were just crazy. And I and it was it was just it was outrageous for me. It really was. And I was just the skinny juggler and, and I felt very, you know, we had to perform topless actually. And so I felt really like underdeveloped in my, in my, you know, right. muscularity. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I started working out, trying to, trying to get beefed up so that I could, you know, look better. Right. But you did eventually, you certainly, you know, beefed well, up and. Now I've beefed out a little bit. I'm working on that right now. I'm on vacation, so I'm trying to get back in shape. Well, you're here. almost 40, man. You hit that 40 in that... Uh, no, I know. 40-year-old spread. So that was the start. So you did two years. And what was what was it like working with Michael Motion with, as a director? What were your experiences that there? That was incredible. I mean, he's so uh, uh, analytical, you know, and, and, and everything has a meaning and, and there's a purpose behind everything, or at least there, he's searching for a purpose. Uh, and, but at the same time, he's very down to earth and you can joke around with him and stuff like that. And, uh, it was, uh, yeah, I really look at him as being my mentor. Uh, just, he's really one of a kind, uh, just gives so much thought into the why behind what it is that he's doing. And he's all about the creative process, not so much about the final outcome as much. Right. <laughs> uh, even I mean, yes, he's interested in that too, but it's more the journey that he really sinks his teeth into. And uh, that's something a lot of jugglers could learn from. I mean, yeah, to use I, juggling as a medium and not as the the final be all. Yeah, we, we talk we talked uh, quite a bit at, at the at the EJC about you know the because he had a, he had a, like a master class and it was interesting i said you know i was in the audience for that and it was interested to hear the questions people were asking you know about what his opinion is on open source and and uh, you know the internet and juggling and and how that it goes and his opinions were very interesting the the one that stuck with me the most was that you know he you know uh, he doesn't he doesn't understand what site swap is so much and doesn't really understand how that can be used to you know create uh, you know, a juggling routine right. or something like that. And, uh, you know, with the internet now, there's a lot of, uh, well, I think it's kind of like for me with the internet, I, the level that juggling has gone to technically is just unbelievable. And I kind of look at it as like a monkey see, monkey do mentality, because if you see someone else do something, then you then know that it's possible. And then you can tell yourself that you can do it too. So, uh, there's a lot of that going on, but then there's also, I think, a lack of creativity within the work too, because you're spending so much of your time just trying to do what other people have already done, or trying to push that technical uh, element. Well, I always say, like, learning to juggle seven balls is not a creative feat; it's a mechanical feat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly you might be creative in the way you approach it, but the feat itself is not something you've created. Sure. So sure. in the early days when there wasn't a lot of inspiration or there was inspiration in a very limited fashion, meaning the guys you saw, like the Francis Bruns or the Chris Cremos, weren't necessarily going to be guys you were going to copy, that we were forced to be a bit more creative. And that nowadays you also can kind of just follow. You didn't, you didn't have the immediacy that you have now with, with you know, everything was analog. And so yeah. you didn't have a thousand and one videos. You know, maybe you had a couple of VHS tapes that you were able to, you know, get from the Jack Benny show or, <laughs> you know, and then you could watch those. But it wasn't the, it wasn't like it is today. And so and, you know, that brings good and bad. Uh so after my, your after your two years, he did two straight years in Las Vegas. Yeah, two years in Vegas, and then the contract with the hotel was that every two years they were supposed to change twenty percent of the show and uh, revamp it to make it fresh for returning audiences or whatever. Anyway, long story short, we well I don't know if you know, but we had a, a big kind of uh, not falling out, but uh, there was a, a big commotion with Steve Wynn. Uh, concerning our piece. He didn't like what we were doing uh, and he wanted us to leave uh, right at the very beginning. Mm. Uh, right, and, right. Uh, because it wasn't danger or it wasn't, it was too... Sensational. It wasn't sensationalistic right. enough. It's a very hypnotic kind of 
piece. And maybe he could, I mean, Steve Wynn is, is legally blind. Right. So, uh, maybe, you know, he was taking all of his cues from, you know, what he was listening to the audience, how they were responding, you know, and, and if they weren't jumping up and cheering, then he didn't think it was good. So who knows? But right. anyway, he didn't like it. But Cirque du Soleil said, OK, we have 100 percent artistic control over this show, so uh, we're going to keep it. So they were kind of holding their ground. And uh, eventually it got pretty heated. I remember uh, being taken out to uh, lunch with Gilles Sequois, who was the uh, director of creation, kind of just under Guy La Liberté, who owns the company. And uh, he basically said it to us straight. He's like, listen, guys, we have to kind of pump up your act and make it a little, <laughs> right, right. Late, get a little bit more Vegas or else, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. So it was really testing the relationship. Right, with Cirque right. du But we were so much caught in the middle because Michael Motion was telling us to go one way and Cirque du Soleil right. was telling us to go another it was it was a very tumultuous time. It was put a lot of pressure yeah. on to do it cleanly too. You're like going, okay, at least we better do it without mistakes. Yeah. So it that's a little tough. pressure you don't need as a juggler, I don't think. Yeah. Well, anyway, they brought they brought in uh, they brought in Michael Motion again to kind of help finish the piece, and really he didn't have the time and resources necessary in order to make it as good as it could have been because there were so many other things behind schedule on this show. The show was supposed to open at the end of 93. It didn't end up opening until Christmas of that year. It was supposed to open like a few weeks before that. That there was, I mean, this, it was just, it was crazy with uh, Franco just going out, out, just just going bonkers with all the logistical problems with the lifts and with the, with the net, this, the, the net for the trapeze act wasn't working properly. There were just so many issues. And, uh, yeah, it was, here you are 18 thrown into it. Yeah, it was it, showbiz. It was showbiz. It was, it was crazy. I'm sure at the end you were pretty seasoned. So you do the two years, you're probably Did pretty, two years like, and then, and then from there, they uh, changed the show around. They uh, they took us out. They put in uh, a flying cue back, Misha Matorin, who was just getting off of Alegria. And they changed the flying trapeze act, and they put in a high bar act. And they took us, and they put us in Kidam, which is... Uh, the show I'm still doing now. <laughs> so so we're doing the same piece in Quidam then? You went you just went to that same piece? Essentially, same technique, but much right. different, much different piece. Uh, we started off as a trio again. Uh, uh, Jean Bernard, who was our third guy, uh, kind of hurt his back and kind of worked his way out of the act. He really wasn't interested in doing it anymore anyway, and he was playing the main Papa character in the show at that time. And he kind of worked his way out of the act. And so then the Manipulation Act became a duo with uh, Stephen Ragatz and myself. And we did it for, for three years. Wow. Between 90, uh, was it 96 and beginning of 99. And uh, yes, and then that we did 12 cities in, in uh, a three-year period. Which is funny now because we do twelve cities in twelve weeks now. <laughs> so what what do you find for the people who are like interested in working with Cirque du Soleil? G give me a couple of, of positives, a couple of negatives. Like what? I mean, you, certainly you're you're not doing a new show, so you you're not doing that that technique anymore. You've created no, a new I'm doing act, my own, doing yeah, I'm doing my own act, and I'm playing. I'm actually now playing the Papa character, right. and uh, I've been doing that. So I have a total of 10 years in with Cirque du Soleil now. I just received my 10-year jacket. Right. After, after, after one year, you get a jacket. After five, you get a jacket. And after 10, you get a jacket. And uh, so I just got my 10-year jacket, I guess, I don't know, six months ago or something. So I guess I have 11 years in now. Anyway, positives uh, are, you know, they take really good care of you in the sense that uh, if you're not inclined to get into the business side of show business, then you really don't have to pay much attention to it if you're happy staying working with Cirque du Soleil because they take care of all of that. Right. So there's no promotion. There's you don't have to update your website. No, there's no self promotion. It's it's you know everything's Steady. taken care of. Yeah. You just show up and do your job and and that's it. I would say the negative side would be that you have a very limited amount of uh, creative input into what you're doing. I, I have a little bit more leeway because I'm doing my own act, even though I'm not doing it every night because I'm a backup act. Uh, right. 
I can do whatever, not whatever I want, you know. Sure, I mean, but you can make changes. Hired, they hired me to do the act that I presented to them when they hired me. But, you know, I have more, uh, you know, I can change things around if I want. I can talk to the musicians. You know, we have live music, so I can say, listen, I'm going to go a little long here. I want to put this new trick in. And as long as I stay within the guidelines, then, you know, they probably pretty much leave me alone. So. And how long, how long is your solo act then that you perform with them? It's just a, I'm around six minutes. Six minutes? I would say. Yeah. About so six you portray minutes. a character throughout the show all the yeah. time. Yeah, I play the Papa character. The Kidam story revolves around the, a family, the mother, the daughter, and uh, the father character. You, you saw the show. So you in, walk uh, through space and you, are you also <laughs> headless at one point, as I remember? I do the walking in the air a bit, yeah. yeah. No, no, I'm not headless. That's okay. the Kidam character. But uh, you came in, in San Francisco. Yeah, when I saw we you were at the Cow Palace. Palace. Yeah, yeah. What a, what a venue. <laughs> <laughs> it was very cavernous. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. And you were very kind. You got us tickets and met us backstage. And... Yeah, it was good. That's one nice thing, the, the arena tour. Well, so the arena tour is such a different universe than being in the big top. And I'm kind of lucky because I've gotten to do like all three of their style of shows. You know, they have their resident shows, which are in theaters, uh, which, you know, you stay put, you know, basically have a, a regular life. You know, you right. go back to your own house at night and... You show up, you know, usually five days a week. It's like, you know, going into the regular day job. Uh, what time would you I, show up? I mean, is it like an, like what time for, let's say the show's at night? Yeah. What's your call time sort of like? Well, to, well now, uh, depends on the day. If it's a two-show day, it's quite a bit earlier. Right. Uh, it really depends on the show schedule. Uh, you know, there's always rehearsals and stuff going on. Sometimes you'll be called in early because... Uh, you, you have, you know, I have other responsibilities besides just doing my juggling act. If they want, if somebody new is coming into the show and they need to re-block, you know, one of the tableaus, one of the, well, one of the sections of the show. Right. And I may be called in to be part of a rehearsal. So they, they you know, they make a schedule up every week and you look at the schedule and you see when you're going to need to come in. And, uh, for the most part though, I don't have to do a whole lot of that extra stuff. I, you know, my main thing is, is just taking taking care and making sure that I'm in shape to do the job that I've been hired to do, which is to do a juggling act whenever and, and you know, whenever is necessary. Right. Cause I don't know my schedule. Usually a lot of times I'll show up and they'll sell, tell me just before the show or an hour before the show, uh, you're on tonight, uh, hand balancing's out. And I said, Oh, okay. So I'm in for hand balancing or, uh, hand to hands out. So, oh, okay. I'm in for hand to hand now. So, so you have to be prepared any I night you could go in and go, okay, tonight you're yeah, doing your, exactly. act. Even during the show, it could happen that someone gets hurt uh, warming up. Right. You know, first half is going, and then they'll say, uh, so and so just hurt themselves. Can you go in for the second half? In the second half. So I kind of have to be ready all the time. So you do, a, you do a daily practice? You have kind of a regime? Yeah, my routine is I show up, you know, a couple, you know, at the call time, official call times an hour before the show. Uh, but that's not nearly enough time to do everything you need to do. Makeup takes at least a half an hour for me. Some people take say, over an hour, depending on how complicated your makeup is. Uh, plus, you need to eat. You know, they they have catering catering team uh, there to cook all the meals for us. And uh, so I get in there, and uh, yeah, I always do like it's about forty five minutes to an hour of practicing of all the techniques that I do in my act. Right. So I try to do that every day. Sometimes I miss a day, but I try to do that every day. And then during the course of the show, uh, there's a lot of times when I'm not on stage. And so in between cues, uh, we say any a cue is, you know, you know what a cue is. Sure. But maybe for the people listening that don't know, a cue is, is uh, uh, basically going on stage and, and f f playing a part for a period of time. Not necessarily your act, but, sure. say, you know, being being a character on stage and interacting with another character or whatever. So I have a lot of those moments in the show. Because you're interwoven with throughout the structure yeah, of the entire show. Yeah, it's very much part of the story of the show. So I'm, I'm on stage a lot, uh, usually not doing a whole lot, but I'm there. <laughs> right, and you have to be present. You have to be, you can't just be walking through it. No. There's certain... No, no. Yeah, energy you, gotta, you have to you have to bring to the part. Very, it's, it's very much an acting role, you know, a silent acting role. Right. So. Uh, so in between my cues, I I come backstage and I practice. It's pretty much what I do. I just work on different things, uh, bounce juggling and clubs and playing with my remote control helicopter or playing my uh, accordion. You know, I've got a basically. I'm I'm trying to 
work on material for a new solo show whenever I decide to leave uh, to leave Kidam, whenever that is. So. So let's talk a little bit about the future then. So yeah. right now you're in between shows. You're at your parents' house. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to go up to Portland, Oregon, because, uh, you know, I, I, I have my own place up there. But when I'm when I'm away, I, I rent it out through this site called Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's like having a second job because I kind of have to be landlord. I have to right. <laughs> talk to my guests and make sure that my it's a resource uh, I, that you need to make sure you're making some money on. Exactly. It's great. It works out great. I bought it like two, three years ago and I've been doing this for two years and it's by far the best investment I've ever made. So it's been really, it's been really good to me. So it is like having a second gig though, because it's, it's constantly making sure everything's up to snuff and, you know, and all of my guests write, write reviews of me and then I write reviews of them. And, right. But, uh, so, but then, anyway. so is there a contract? Are you contracted for a certain period of time now? I, uh, with uh, with with Cirque du Soleil, yeah. a year at a time. I see. So there's a still. When does it come up uh, to be it, renewed? It should be this week. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> the thing is that that this is a very weird period for us. We're actually on a very a long tour break, a three month tour break, which is the longest Kidam has ever been dark. And w essentially, what has happened? We've been in Europe since September. And in this arena tour, we play a different city every week, generally 10 weeks on, two weeks off. And during those two weeks off, most people, you know, go back home or they'll, you know, sure. maybe stay in Europe on vacation or whatever. And we have 100 people in the show, 50 cast and the rest technicians and, and logistics and office and catering and all these other departments and 20 over 20 different nationalities in the show. And people just scatter all over the globe for their tour breaks. And uh, so this last leg got cut short because the promoter that uh, was working in uh, Germany dropped the ball and were not able to secure the last few weeks of shows. So we ended up going on an early tour break and then they were trying to get another city last minute, which turned out to be Tunis, Tunisia. Mm -hmm. True. But that ended up getting canceled because the venue that they were trying to put the show in was not uh, capable of, of hosting the show for whatever reason. Uh, I didn't get the all the, the we, we found that out the day before we went on tour break. So that kind of screwed up everybody's travel. And so then we went from having a five week tour break to having a seven week tour break. And then the war in Israel broke out while we were on tour break. Right. <laughs> And so we're supposed so, to go to Tel Aviv. It was after that. To Tel Aviv, uh, August first. We're supposed to be in, starting in Tel Aviv, so they canceled that. And our next uh, official uh, show, uh, scheduled shows, is starting. Uh, I have to be in in Athens, Greece, on the sixteenth of September. So that's that's when we officially head back to work. And I think the premiere is a few days after that. Uh, the the reason that that much time has gone past is because the types of visas that we were able to secure for everyone in the show were, I think, a type C visa. Anyway, basically, we had to leave the Schengen zone, which is this region of countries in the EU, European Union, uh, pretty much all of them, with the exception of the UK, uh, Romania and Croatia. Anyway, we have to leave those countries for, for 90 days before we can come back. And we were in Europe for at least 180 days. So they timed it all out so that, you know, it would work out that we would. Uh... Are you still there, Dan? Oh, my yeah. Computer... No, I'm oh, listening. My computer just went, went blank. No, so you're talking about. So break the news here, Pat. Are you going to sign up for another year? Is this going to be a. Yes, I'm going to sign up for at least one more year. <laughs> and the main reason for that is a financial one, because. The way the circus operates is they there's this unwritten agreement that the uh, the company guarantees you 300 shows a year. As performers in Cirque du Soleil, you are uh, paid on a per show basis. Right. And uh, most gigs, you know, are either by gig if it's a gal or corporate thing, or per week. You know, if you're on a cruise ship, usually it's a weekly thing. Uh, that's the way most most things work. So. But Cirque du Soleil is a per show, per show deal, and uh, they guarantee you 300 shows, so you kind of know roughly about how much money you're going to make. Uh, but you only will get that 300 shows if you agree to sign for the 
following year. Oh, right. <laughs> so this year, because I see. of the massive mega break that we're on, right. it's falling way short of the 300. By we're signing for another year, they have to guarantee, they have to make they, that guarantee. They have to basically pay me out, pay us out for 60 shows at the end of the year that we didn't perform, which is a massive sure. uh, amount of our salary. Yes. You know, it's a huge percentage. So I would sign on for another year, Pat. That's, that's my plan. <laughs> that's my recommendation. Financial advisor, Dan. Yep, yep. <laughs> Well, you know, I think we're getting towards the end, but um, I, I really want to thank you. I think you've given us a good insight into sort of the the way things come and go, or the way, you know, things you fall into things. Next thing you know, it's been 10 years of this journey. Yeah. And for, I think for some people, I mean, nowadays, the idea of working with Cirque du Soleil for some types of jugglers is sort of the epitome uh, right. of what's available to them. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally get it. It's, you know, it's Cirque du Soleil is a huge brand. It's all over the world now. And people, you know, and there's some amazing, you know, Anthony Gatto was mm -hmm. until recently working in Cirque du Soleil. Victor Key, you know, uh, Vladek was with, you know, I, I feel very humbled that I, I, I am, uh, you know, working in the same company as all these. Uh, well, you deserve it, Pat. You're, you're a strong juggler. You got great presence. Well, you're thank a you, consistent Dan. guy. I think you're one of the nicest guys in juggling. If I can say that. Thank you. And I really appreciate you taking the time and talking to the people here through me on the Drop Everything podcast. Thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed Drop Everything podcast number six, my conversation with Pat McGuire. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I'd like to thank our sponsors. First and foremost, the International Juggling Association. Information about the IJA can be found at juggle.org. Check out eJuggle magazine for the latest in juggling news, and also to find every Drop Everything podcast. Also, BrainDrizzles.com, that's B-R-A-I-N-D-R-I-Z-Z-L-E-S, BrainDrizzles.com. That's my personal coaching and mentoring website. I offer services in comedy writing, career development, and so much more at BrainDrizzles.com. I hope you enjoyed it. Stick around. There's just a lot of silence coming up because the podcast is over, but... I'm very excited about the next podcast coming up. It'll be my conversation with Michael Karras. Have a good day and drop everything except when you're juggling.